All right. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Coffee with Artists. Uh, our guest this morning, he has bummed the global landscape with unforgettable images, both on the street, in museums, movies, books, documentary television shows. Um, he's referred to often as the godfather of street art, and his career spans pretty much four decades, right? <laughs> it's It's been a big one. Um, so yeah, I, please, my, I saw my first painting in the 60s, so yeah. There. So five... <laughs> Five decades, where, where are yeah. we now? Yeah, five. So please allow me to introduce the wonderful Ron English. Ron, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. And we, we did, uh, I had the pleasure of chatting with you last year on the podcast when things looked very different to what we're dealing with today. So we were just chatting briefly this, this morning before we jumped on the live about how it's impacting us, you know, creatively, mm -hmm. emotionally. Tell us what it's looking like for you right now. Well, I, I had a weird year because I actually work, woke up New Year's Day and I had nothing in my whole life ever again. It was weird. You know, but um, you figure, well, stuff will happen. You know, everybody's like on holiday or whatever. And so like within a week, I had the entire year, year completely booked. You know, like first first week we got on a plane, went to Hawaii, then we went to China. We just I just kept going. And then we even did a tour of uh, the United States in the fall. So so we went from nothing to being complete. Every day was filled. Every minute was filled. And then it was over just that quick, which is kind of weird because I, I, I don't know, like I'm a weird person. Like I, you know, I wish for things or pray for things and then they come true. And then I think I should have been more specific because I, 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 I walked around, I live in this little town, Beacon, really sweet little town. And, uh, you know, I'm obsessed with uh, sec, uh, Second Saturday or just the local stuff. And people are like, you know, you, you do stuff all over the world. Why why are you so into this little town? And it's like, but it, but I just I just love it. It's just very nice and sweet. And um, so my my goal is like, I just want to spend one year in Beacon and not have to leave and not have to go on the road. And then and then it happened, you know. And Lo was, and behold. Yeah, but I didn't want it to happen like that. Do you know what I mean? I wanted <laughs> it wasn't a good, well. No, like um, years ago, I moved to New York and I said I want to go live in New York City. I want to make big paintings. And I want them to go to museums, you know, so I'll spend my day making these big paintings and, um, you know, I'll think of the ideas, I'll make the paintings and then they'll be off to museums. It's like, how, what could be better than that? Right. Mm. And very, very quickly that, that came true. Hmm. But I mean, it was all true. I was making big paintings. I was thinking of the ideas. I was sketching them on the canvas, painting them and, and off to museums. They went, I was painting for another artist. So they were his paintings. And he mm. did let me have the ideas. I said, you know, if you let me have the ideas, it'll be more fun for me. You know, I'll get more challenging things or maybe ideas I'm more into and I'll be more focused. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like I forgot that one thing. It's like, God, it's like when I prayed to, you know, for all these things, it's like I, for, I left one thing off. Can I, like, write <laughs> name on the paintings? <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like that with this. It's like, man, I still wanted just, um, you know, time in the studio and time alone and time in this sweet little town. And then and I got it. But, you know, I didn't want it this way. Right. Very right. unusual circumstances. So let me ask you, how much of that, um, you know, putting it out to the universe, do you think is hooky spiritual stuff? And how much of it is you manifesting your own destiny by taking actions? Um, no, I think if, if you put stuff out there, it, it comes back and it comes back, you know, usually through uh, circumstances sometimes, but mostly through other people. I mean, just think about all your friends and it's like, oh, my friend's birthday's coming up. Oh, you know, like they really like shag and it's like, and then you're at something and you see a shag, like a rare shag toy and you're like, perfect. Or, you know, if they like elephants or whatever you, but you're going to, if, if, if you, if they put out in the world, I like elephants and then the elephant stuff's going to come back to them. Or like, remember when um the, the guy from the Beatles, um, the bass player, George Harrison, you know, once he just mentioned in a, a, a comment that he really liked jelly beans and then, <laughs> and then, then thousands of people were coming to their concerts and throwing <laughs> jelly beans at him. You know, and he's thinking, yeah, just maybe like a handful of jelly beans that not, not right. have pelted at me, you know. But I mean, he threw, put that in the universe and it came back, you know, hugely. And, now, and probably not what he was looking for. but uh, Probably yeah. not. But now the advertisers have capitalized on that by serving as ads for everything we even mention or click or, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember the first time I got uh, profiled, um, the Internet decided I was a cowgirl. 
<laughs> and I was getting all kinds of cowgirl ads and you know, you want a new saddle for your horse. And But what happened was um, I have a character called Kathy Cowgirl. So sometimes I have people play her. So I need a lot of different sizes of uh, costumes and daisy shorts and guns and everything that, that a cowgirl would have. So I spent a lot of time on the internet collecting all this cowgirl stuff. So then the internet decided that I was a cowgirl. So it was That's kind of- hilarious. Well, given the amount of characters that you have, I'm surprised you haven't been profiled as, you know, this multi-personality. <laughs> well, she's the only one that I actually have, uh, you know, like I can easily make a human into. Um, the other ones that like I have big costumes for and it's more elaborate. So they have to be more special, specialized, yeah. That's hilarious um, and awesome. So- What do you think about, um, you know, now everybody's wearing masks because, you know, we all got paranoid because, you know, there's facial recognition. So like when you're in China, and if you're a Chinese citizen and let's say you cross the street, you know, in the middle of the street, well, that's jaywalking. And if a camera picks you up, facial recognition, then you get points taken off. So you you have like a point system. So if you lose enough points, guess what? You don't get to travel anymore. You don't get to get on an airplane anymore. So it actually, you reduce your social status, you know, by committing these, these little petty crimes that you don't even realize anybody's, you know, watching. So, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, of course we're going to do that here. But then suddenly, you know, something always comes in and saves you. So it's like, now if we all have to wear a mask, well, I'm just going to wear a mask with Trump's face on it. So, or, or do you know what I mean? My worst enemy's face. <laughs> but, you know, the facial recognition thing isn't going to work now because we're all wearing masks. Right. The facial and, re recognition thing is yeah. terrifying. But I, I, yeah. like, I like wearing the mask because I walk around and do like what I normally do and have gotten in a lot of trouble for. But it's like, you know, all the cameras pick me up. <laughs> but who is it? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, maybe the hair will give me away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, maybe. It's, it's kind of like, I, I understand it. It's like, I know that, you know, people wore hoodies because they were shy or they just didn't want people really looking at them. They want to be more anonymous. And, you know, a lot of women, you know, wear the whole garb. And and, and I can kind of understand it. You feel very anonymous. You, you can be in public, but being anonymous at the same time. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting experience. It, it, there's so many interesting elements of what we're dealing with. You know, what you were just sharing there about the, the facial recognition stuff sounds like a Black Mirror episode. I don't know whether you've ever it's seen that Black show. Mirror. It's great, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like uh, really frightening because a lot of these concepts could really come to fruition. Like mm -hmm. the idea of your status and your, you know, kind of like your Uber ratings, right? Like when you take an Uber, you get rated by the driver and you have a certain point system. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that happening in real time when you navigate the world is really quite a frightening. Mm -hmm. You know, this stuff has always existed because I've, you know, like I was in a gallery and they put my big painting in the window and then I come back the next day and it's down. And I'm like, why did you take it down? Oh, we got complaints. I'm like, how many complaints? Well, one. Mm. One person complained. But they were very adamant, you know, and you realize how much the complainers, how much power they have. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So anyway, it, it, you think about anything that happened to you before, it'll probably be amplified now. Yep. So how are you finding this time creatively? Are you feeling like you're inspired? Are you taking things down a notch? Oh, no, no. Um, I, I I have this world called Delusionville that, um, you know, exists 90% in my head. And I've been looking for the opportunity to really show you what every plant looks like, what every animal looks like, what every house looks like, you know, and really take a deep dive into it. But that's something that's going to take like a year, a year and a half. And I never had that time before. So I'm excited, you know, and I, I, I you know, I love being you know, having such a great time while everybody else is suffering. But at the same time, it's like, I'm going to try to use this time to kind of flesh out that world, you know, and make it whole. And then when the world comes back online, that'll be done. You know, I'll have the Bible of Delusionville. And when you talk about the, the you know, showing us every element of it, are you showing this through painting, through sculpture? Because you, you kind of bridge a number of different, uh, you know, aesthetics, a number of different mediums. Well, up to the point, yeah. I was sculpting everything up, up till like a couple of weeks ago. Then, 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 you know, the world started coming a little bit back online. And I don't know if it's real or not, but like I was supposed to have this big show at, at a museum in China. And then they're like, it's back online for uh, July. So, and we need one giant painting. So I've had to kind of, I've kind of had to abandon the Delusionville for a minute to finish some big paintings. But, uh, but you know, I don't think I'm going to China in July. I think they're being very optimistic. And if I go, I have to go, you know, there, go into a little apartment, be in quarantine for two weeks, and then do the show for like three days, which I don't think anybody would even show up, yeah. and, and then go back into quarantine for two weeks and then fly back to the United States. So, but I think, you know, with something like that, you have to kind of assume it's going to happen, even though you know it's not, because you don't want to be caught like, you know, it's, we're going, you know, and it's like, oh, you know, I didn't finish all the paintings because I really didn't think this is going to happen.
Right. So I don't know. Life is still confusing. I feel like there's almost going to be, you know, yes, things are going to open back up, but even when they do, we're going to be, there's going to be a lot of people who are still in fear mm -hmm. that, that won't, you know, perhaps go out to those major events or, you know, places where there's going to be a lot of people. How do you think the art world in general is going to respond to this? I don't know. I think uh, in a year and a half, people start congregating again. It's just, we're too social, you know, mm. I don't know. How does it look in terms of sales? Are you seeing a dip? Are you seeing a surge? We're hearing such mis mixed messages here. We're hearing one, some people are spending more because they're on, on home furnishings, on artwork, because they mm -hmm. are sitting in their homes. And then the other idea is obviously that people are completely broke. Right. Well, um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's like um, we I think we we dropped our first toy after the quarantine happened and it sold out. Um, so it seems like everything we're offering is selling out. But, you know, I don't know how much more stuff we're going to be able to get done. Even stuff we do locally, it's like the, it takes a team to pour the molds and stuff. So mm -hmm. so I, I guess that'll kind of wear out. But I was very shocked that people kept spending money. And uh, well, I sold like a painting to the uh, the bass player for Pearl Jam uh, last week. But you know, I think that a lot of people have a lot of money. Uh, you know, like, um, you know, what's my art dealer doing? He's stuck in his loft, but, you know, he's smart. Mm -hmm. And so he's figuring out, you know, a lot of people made a lot of money, a lot of money off this. And so he's sorting through and trying to figure out who who, who banked like tons of money. And then who which one of those collect art? And you know what I mean? So he's got his, you know, his stable of artists. And then he's pitching these people art, you know? I mean, you just made $600 million. It's like, would you like a painting? They're only 50,000, you know, or whatever. I don't know. But I mean, that's, you know, what he does. So I think people are just kind of adapting in whatever way they can. It's a sad state of affairs when people made hundreds of millions of dollars from a pandemic that's killing people in such a, you know, but I, I, I think it, it was that hard to figure out it was happening because we already knew, you know, it was going on in China and, and we knew it was bad and we knew that they weren't able to contain it. And we also know that they're a lot stricter society than we are. And that if you tell people to stay inside, mm -hmm. they stay inside. Yeah, they, they do. You, do. you know, maybe it's because you got a guy with an M16 on the corner. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're, 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 they're more obedient and they're going to play by the rules that you lay down. And here I just thought, you know. I mean, what, a bunch of Midwestern factory working bikers are going to stay in their house. I don't think so. You know, I think that they're just going to do whatever they want to do, you know, and I oh. think that's kind of part of America. So I, I wasn't sure. It seemed like I thought it would spread worse here. So, but then I didn't take my money out of the stock market either. So, but I thought, I thought the whole thing will collapse for a year and a half. And then, you know, I'm not going to retire for five years. So I just have to ride the whole thing out. I'll probably be back probably in five years. We'll be where we were like three months ago, you know? Hmm. But I, I can never think about selling stock or anything like that, maybe because that's not what I do. Well, maybe you didn't get an insider, um, you know, comment and you're working well, for the government. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the Trump guys were, were told pull now, you know. Mm -hmm. But he also knew that they weren't going to try to contain the virus, you know, and right. I didn't know that. Do you know what I mean? I didn't know how that they were going to deal with it. So I didn't, have, you know, I didn't have that information. But yeah, I mean, the first thing that you do is you you, you protect your own, you protect your donors, you protect your people and, th and then then you start worrying about the rest of the population hmm. or that's what he, that's the way he, he approaches. i was gonna say that's what that's what he does <laughs> but, you know he, he's interesting because he doesn't have he has a different sense of um like history like hillary um you know she thought my place in history will be getting america a stellar healthcare system you know and then oh, then it'll be terrible tempted. The whole world will talk about, oh yeah, the American healthcare system is better than Sweden's or whatever. It's probably the the primo healthcare system in the world. And you know who did that? Hillary Clinton. And that's her that's her claim to fame. That's that's puts her into history. You know, because they all want to be in history. And you know, Trump is just kind of like, well, if I'm the dictator, you know, all the history books are gonna say I'm the greatest thing that ever happened to America. Yeah, there's not going to be any criticism, so that'll be the story. So, like with Lincoln, I mean, was he a bad guy or a good guy? I mean, he got half the country slaughtered. You know, I mean, did did he have to have a civil war? Could he worked out a different deal? But you know, once once it's done and you win, then you tell the story. You know, so I don't know. What do you think his story will be? I think if he wins, his story will be he's the greatest thing that ever happened to America. America was a cl crumbling empire, and he propped it all back up and made it all great and and made it what it could be and. You know, I mean, it, it would just be like Mao or um, Kim Jong-un or any, anybody like that. I mean, Kim, they, they, these people are just the 
the whole society adores them, you know, because the only story they ever hear is how great they are. Do you know? Mm. No, I think the thing I worry about is people like us. It's like, it, it's not, it, it, when you get a totalitarian society, it's, it, it may be great for a, a small group of people, but, and it may, a lot of people may not even hardly notice. It's like, all I do is go to Walmart, my factory job. So what, I get stuck at the park, you know, with, and have my family picnic, but I don't notice. I don't notice, but you know, artists will notice, you know what I mean? Minorities will know, noticed, you know, but I think that, you know, the, the white boys ain't going to notice. Hmm. I don't think they'll benefit either, but I, I don't think it'll, their lives will be that much different. I remember you telling me in our interview last year that you had experienced him firsthand, him being Trump, um, you know, back in, I guess, the 90s, or, you know, you'd kind of seen this character around and, and you said something really interesting. You said, you know, he's, he's portrayed as being stupid in the media. This man's not stupid. He's brilliant. Tell me about that. I mean, he, he, he's, he's brilliant. He's a great political operator. He knows how to distract people. Like, it's like a magician, you know, um, magician didn't really disappear anything, but, but you believe that he did. Do you know what I mean? So he knows how to distract people and how to keep them all in a frenzy and keep himself in the, in the center, you know, which is kind of counterintuitive because if you think about Lloyd Goldman or, you know, different billionaires in New York, They'll do anything they can to stay out of the press because you know the more famous I am, the more the more the more difficult my life becomes, <laughs> and the more dangerous my life becomes because somebody's going to want to you know assassinate me or or kidnap me because you know like I deal with a lot of people in other countries and they're constantly being kidnapped or their aunts being kidnapped and then the kidnappers inadvertently kill them, you know maybe because they don't intend to kill them but you know it's like they're not taking very good care of them, and so like most billionaires want to avoid that you know, kind of scrutiny. And then he, he went the opposite direction and said, you know, I'm, I'm fame is a very powerful tool and I'm going to use it, you know? Mm. No, I, I don't think, I just think that, you know, I, I consider him an adversary to the American people. And I don't think it's beneficial to think of him as stupid. You know, he's playing you. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I mean, you may say, hey, he wants to tear down the healthcare system because he's got this gleaming hospital behind the hospital. So if we knock down this hospital, there's going to be a great hospital behind it that's even better and cooler, you know, and, and there isn't, you know, I think even the Republicans thought, do we really need to tear down Obamacare? Because, you know, we didn't think you would be this good of a salesman. Huh. We didn't think you would, that you could convince the American people that they should just throw away our healthcare system. Because uh -huh. we, we actually don't have another healthcare system in the, in the queue, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. we didn't expect you to be this successful at, you know what I mean? But some of my Republican friends said, yeah, we didn't expect, we didn't like him at first. He wasn't one of us. And, but, you know, at some point we realized we can do anything we want now. He, he will give us cover to do anything. And so I think they, they kind of adapted very quickly. Hmm. You know, Andrew Yang, uh, during the Dem debates last year, he said something that really struck me. He said, you know, Trump is a symptom and not the cause of the nation's problems. You know, you, you shared with me that you grew up in the Midwest and, you know, this is really a place where people have been feeling disenfranchised for some time. A lot of industry obviously was kind of abandoned. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what do you, what are you seeing and hearing from people in those parts of the country in terms of what might be next? Are people angry? Are people happy oh, in their yeah. little bubbles? There's some super smart people in the Midwest that seem to have a, understand what's going on. And then there's a lot that, you know, you realize that well, I was talking to one of my friends and I keep trying to convince him. It's like, this is a bad man. You got to you got to drop this Trump love. And finally, he admitted that, you know, in his whole life, he's never once read the New York Times ever. Yeah. So, you know, he grabs a little fox here, a little rush there. And that that's his media diet. And so he goes, you don't understand. It's like the only negative thing I've ever heard about Trump is through you and your friend Constant, the filmmaker, because we came and shot a bunch of my old friends from high school for this documentary that, uh, that the Constant's making. But yeah, he goes, you don't understand. We've never heard a negative thing about Trump. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, that's that's interesting. Hmm. But, you know, because I'm friends with them also, I, I get the same feeds as them. And I realize that, that all their news is fake. It's all fake, and he's discredited the New York Times and and, and the Washington Post and, and and actual credible you know news outlets. Um, he's conflated, you know, Fox is like a real news outlet. It's equal to CNN, and and they're confused, you know, and and they they're constantly trying to support him. So they're finding, you know, these news outlets like New York Two. There's no New York Two. New York Two. It's like well, it's, it's one. Of, it's your town, dude. It's your town. 
York too. <laughs> you know, it's like there is no York too. Uh-huh. They're just making up. I mean, how? Do, you know, like it, it's easy for me to spot because the, especially the Russian stuff, like they misspell stuff. Uh-huh. Like what credible news outlet would just be grammatically incorrect and in, in lots of misspellings? They don't even have spell check, but they're just churning stuff out. You know, and there's also a weird phenomena of. You know, right wingers will share anything that buttresses their position or the or the way they want things to be, and my liberal friends will not do that. I mean, if I put one erroneous thing up or one you know clumsy news source, they're all over me. They're yelling at me, you know, and, and they would never share that. They're like, where, where did that come from? That doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? But a Republican go, oh yeah, Hillary kills babies. <laughs> you know. Well, when the president yeah. is resharing articles that come from the same sources, yeah. when the, the leader of the free world, I mean, just recently he shared something that was, I, I heard it was by uh, the same source that posted the whole Pizzagate. Uh, you know, the Democrats are running a pedophile ring below a pizza store. Like if the president's retweeting that stuff, like the fish stinks from the head, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think a lot of people have not really considered They've always thought of the president as a person of authority, and they've had a certain trust in that office. And you know, so it it it, you know, a lot of people says I've always respected my president. I never questioned who who it was. I never you know said I don't really like Obama, so I'm going to disrespect the presidency. I've always given reverence to that office and the, the person in it. And you know, and you seem to question everything. It's like we don't understand you. It's like that's not patriotic to question everything. It's like what country do you think you're in? You know what I mean? Sort of the idea of this country is that we question everything and that, that we hold everybody's feet to the fire. And I think a lot of my old friends would be a lot happier in Russia because they, it is kind of a lockdown state. And, uh-huh. and, they, and they do have a great leader who's very powerful. And, and if you go against him, he'll have you whacked, you know? Hmm. So I want to switch to a question about your, that it's a quote actually from your book. I have your book right here. For anyone who doesn't have this, go check it out. It's awesome. It's a super interesting read and amazing, amazing uh, capture of your, just a great retrospect of your career. But one of your quotes in here, you said, truth in advertising sounds like a cliche, but it's a radical idea. So you talk about kind of finding enjoyment in in disrupting the message, right? In disrupting the narrative. And you, you said, it's like putting a fly in the soup. Like how do we, with all these new sources of of advertisement, of media, um, putting out this lies, fake news, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. how do we how do we respond to that? How do you plan to respond to that? Well, you know, it, it, it got a lot more difficult because normally I went around the country doing billboards and things that I don't seem to be able to do right now. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I have no interest. Huh. You know, I, I, I just feel like if I can just convince one person, you know, like don't don't go to Jonestown. That guy is not who you think he is. That guy's not got your best interests in heart. He's going to take you down, you know. And none of their family told them that. They just thought, oh, okay, <laughs> whatever. Sounds like a nice guy to me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're going to go live in paradise. Have fun. You know what I mean? But somebody needed to stop them. Somebody needed to intervene. You know. And sometimes you can just pick off one. Like if 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 uh, you get attacked by a bunch of wolves. You're supposed to figure out which one's the alpha and it and, and go for that one. Do you know what I mean? And not you can't bite off a pack of wolves, but if you can, you know, punch the lead wolf in the face, the other ones actually back off. Huh. So, like, if you could get to any of these, because every community has like their community leader, the, the one everybody kind of looks up to. And you know, a lot of my friends are like, hey, we're just like putting ideas out there. It's like, but you're not vetting the ideas. You're just putting ideas out there. And if you just if you would just like vet the ideas you put, I think because we're not just ha- we're not having a a discussion. This isn't an adult discussion because you're, you're a grandfather. You have grandkids and you have kids. And you know what? That whole family looks to you. You're the patriarch, you know, and they, they're thinking, we don't understand what's going on. We're confused. Let's look at our Uncle Greg. And, you know, he's going to tell us the real deal, you know, because he's the, the wise man of the family. And he's not. He's spreading Russian propaganda. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you could get one of those guys to stop doing that, that would be a great achievement. You know what I mean? Like, figure out what you're spreading. Don't just spread it because, hey, you know, just throwing the extra ideas out there. You know, you're an authority figure to a, to a group of people, you know. Mm-hmm. And you, you have children. You have kind of millennial age children. And they're how, actually trapped here in the house with us. You know? they, <laughs> how, well, how, how is that? How are they doing? <laughs> um, I'm sure it's harder on them. They, um, you know, my son got kicked out of college and sent home. And um, I don't know, you know, he's going to graduate next week. 
you know, without his class. And um, I don't know if he gets to go to graduate school in the fall. You know, he did, they don't know what's going on. And my daughter can't go get a job. She's stuck here and she helps oh. us, with, you know, the fulfillment of stuff and sort of helps us run the little business. But yeah, it's, I'm sure it's very hard on them. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's your time to be social in life. Right. You know, I mean, I'm stuck here with my beautiful wife and my beautiful kids. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's like <laughs> fantasy. I kept saying, it's like, you don't understand. It's like dad's having a good time. This is like the fantasy of, of a dad is that the kids get <laughs> have to come home and, you know, you have the whole family together. And it's like, it, it's not that, that, that's not their time in life for this, you know. Mm. So I loved hearing Governor Cuomo talk about his having his daughter's home. It was a real kind of human moment from him. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're not used to gathering as families anymore. It's not kind mm-hmm. of the, you know, the, the social norm to just get together and spend this amount of time together. So I mean, there are some positives that do come out of this. Obviously, there's a lot of negatives, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people are really suffering. Like my friend mm-hmm. lost her, you know, husband last year, and she's alone, you know, and so it's super hard for her. It's not hard for me at all because I just mm-hmm. get up and go do what I want to do every day. And, and 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 we have a big enough house that sometimes I won't see my daughter for two days, you know. <laughs> I mean, do you know what I mean? It's, 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 we're in a good place for this to happen to us, you know, and I know a lot of people aren't. And uh, I just, you know, like when you're single, you, you go out a lot and that's kind of part of, you know, maybe you just don't want to be with one person because you want to be, you know, hanging out with a lot of people or I don't know. But I know it's, it must be very, very hard. And, and then also some people, I mean, they probably don't know where they're going to get money or do you know what I mean? Or, uh-huh. I mean, I tell most people don't even pay your rent anymore. Don't worry about it. <laughs> they're not going to kick you out. There's nobody yeah. else to put in there, you know? But right. you know, I don't know how they're going to deal with it, you know. It concerns me that there's people that can't get food to feed their families. I was just hearing some stories out of, like, uh, you know, the shelters in New York are just struggling for food, like basic, mm-hmm. basic needs. It's That's, you know, kind of where we're heading. So, it's yeah, I mean, whatever is going to happen hasn't really happened yet, right? Mm-hmm. We don't know how the system is going to break down or hold together. Mm-mm. Well, that's pretty terrifying. So let's talk a little bit about um, you created this amazing um, imagery, this Abe Lincoln Obama during the 2008 presidential campaign. If anybody mm-hmm. watching has not seen it, go- do yourself a favor and Google it right now. Um, you know, Obama was this charismatic, hopeful, inspiring character. You know, 2008 was kind of a, a year that we were ready for some energy, right? Mm-hmm. After, you know, eight years of Bush. But right now we're kind of existing in these darker days. Um, you know, there's a sense of desperation, of despair. Do you plan to get behind Joe or do you plan to put out any kind of anti-Trump artwork? Are you feeling inspired to do that right now? Well, I think that, um, you know, going into the last election, you know, I think that um, I put out too much anti-Trump stuff. And, you know, people said, look, you're making him more famous. You know, you're making him the center of all attention. You know, he's the star of the show. You're making him the star of the show. It's like the the Sopranos. Tony Soprano is like a, a sociopath, idiot. But he, you root for him. Do you know what I mean? And you're making everybody root for Trump because you're making him the center of the, the attention. And, um, you know, we were super into Bernie and we were supporting him and, and raising money for him and doing everything we could for him. And then when he was out, I don't know. I think a lot of there was a lot of people were really angry, and and then you know at some point we, um, you know, Peter Rosenthal, the the promoter, said, "Look, um, what if we get the the same team together? You know, Shepard Ferry and you know the people that did the Obama campaigns and did the different stuff for that, and we'll go out and do it for Hillary." And then he goes, "Let me see. I'm going to call the campaign and see if they would be into that, or maybe they can even help us out a little bit financially. Would you be in? You know?" And I said, "Yeah, I'm in." And the other character said, "Yeah, we're in. We'll do it." You know not our first choice, but no, it's, it would be great to have a competent, you know, anyway, everybody was in and then she, she was out. She was like, you guys all went for the wrong, you all backed the wrong horse last time. Not, not interested. You know, just don't, don't bother. I got this, (laughs) you know, and I don't know, you know, and we should have just went for it anyway, but we didn't, we just thought, well, if you got it, you know, it's because it's weird and I wish it wasn't like that. And I'm, I'm a victim of it, you know, as much as anybody else, but you know, we all have our little egos. And if you tell us to piss off, you know, then we're not going to go promote you. You know what I mean? Mm. You know, I don't know. I mean, I wish I wasn't like that because I, I should have just went out and promoted or did something, but I, I didn't, you know, I just did big, huge murals of Trump. <laughs> you know, well, I think a lot of us just assumed that it was going to happen, that we were going to have Hillary in, in office. I mean, all the stats, you had Nate Silva coming out, telling us all this great news and, you know, it's looking, the statistics no. are, 
I thought he was going to win, and I didn't think there was any way to stop him. And again, because I just talked to so many people online that go, this is this guy's he he's literally coming down from the greatest life in the world. It's like this is almost like Jesus descending from heaven. This guy has the perfect life. Hmm. And he's gonna come down from his pristine, perfect life, the all the life we all wish we had, and he's gonna throw himself into the snake pit hmm. and be demoralized and beaten up and humiliated to save us. And, and you're one of the snakes trying to bite him. Look what he's doing for us. How many people come down from the heights to help us? They don't. They ignore us. And and there he here he comes gliding down the escalator. He's gonna. He's our guy. <laughs> you know. And Hillary, I don't know. You can't you can't demoralize somebody for like how, how many years did the, the Republican Party attack her? Mm-hmm. I mean that that stuff embeds in people. You know. Mm-hmm. I mean even even now I you know I, I I did I got a call from the New York Times a couple of weeks ago and you know like oh fake news. <laughs> what are you? It's like they beat that into your head till it's. And, you, and she was so demoralized for so long. And none of this stuff, you know, I, I really didn't like that she voted for the Iraq War, and that was like a real huge negative for me. That was a real huge negative for me. But you know, like Benghazi was just a fuck up. I mean, the the the, the Republicans, you know, pulled the money so they couldn't have security. They couldn't have proper security. So I mean, if anybody, it was anybody's fault. It was their fault. And it was like, wait, how many people died? Four. I mean, four people have died since we started this conversation from mm-hmm. Trump's fuck up, but nobody cares. Mm-hmm. So, But her well, emails, Ron, what about her emails? Well, you know, here's my, as soon as they said that, you know, my wife worked at uh, Booz and Allen Hamilton back in the day. And I didn't like the idea of us taking government or the, you know, the people in the government taking the government secrets and then offloading them to a private corporation. Mm-hmm. And even when I, they started, first started doing that, I thought, you know, one of those people is, is going to go sell those secrets. They're going to go to some other country, and they're going to sell those secrets, and they're going to be a billionaire in some other country. Or I, I mean, I didn't. I just, I just knew it's like you don't want to send that to a private corporation who has separate interests than 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 the government has. Do you know what I mean? So I thought that was super smart of her to protect her secrets because you know what, the Russians didn't hack her emails. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They hacked the DNC uh, emails, but she protected our national secrets. She had been in the government long enough to know that that that. You don't just hand that stuff off to a private corporation because they kicked you some money. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I thought that was quite brilliant of her to to protect that. You know, and the, the first thing I would have said is 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 I'm sorry, Snowden, Snowden. <laughs> Do you understand why I'm trying to protect the national secrets of the United States of America mm-hmm. and not handing them off to a private corporation because they gave me four hundred thousand dollar campaign donation? Do you not understand this, mm-hmm. Snowden? You know, and then. Like she didn't try to address it. I thought, and sometimes if you don't try to address something, it seems like you're being nefarious or you're up to something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just bold face say, "Look, you know, yeah, I broke a couple of rules, but I broke them in 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 to protect our country." Do you know what I mean? That that was mm-hmm. kind of my take on it. And, and, and meanwhile, Trump has all the stuff on a private server. And nobody could care less. You know, everything that right. all for evil. You know, he did for day one. You know, and it's like, oh, you know, well, it's okay if he does it. <laughs> it's like. I know. He does it in plain sight, right? Well, yeah, here's a game. If you have any Trump Trumpy friends, it's and, and it's kind of interesting. And I don't understand the psychology of what's going on. I've never heard of this syndrome, you know, at this level before. But they will defend anything he does, anything yeah. he says. Um, so, so just next time you see one of your Trumpy friends, just say some crazy erroneous things, and then and say, you know, Trump said this or Trump did this, and they will immediately. Start defending him. Well, that's that's good. He did that, and blah 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 blah. And then, then after they've kind of like worn themselves out trying to defend him, go. I just made that up. Mm. And they sit there for a minute, like, oh, you know, I just wasted all this mental energy trying to defend something that you made up. <laughs> but but their immediate response is defend, defend, defend. Mm. And yeah, I think you know now that that they don't have baseball and soccer and football, they, they spend their whole day like, let's defend Trump. He's our team. He's our guy. You know, let's just battle for him all day. Let's find, you know, more Russian propaganda and, and beat people over the head with it. You know? It's but, amazing to me that they, like, l- laud him like he's this, you know, savior when he couldn't care less about the little people. He's in this gold palace. Like, how is he relatable to the modern, you know, the, the working man or woman? Like, how is he so out of touch? Um, yeah, well, and, and, and worse than that, he exploits people. He mm-hmm. exploits uh, the lower classes. He, he burns all, he, he, I mean, he just, he never paid any of those contractors. Most mm-hmm. of these people are like, you know, they, they work in a factory or they are a contractor and, and they're the exact people that he rips off. But mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, 
I, I still think the Democrats were completely did not understand what was going on. They they thought, oh, we got him, you know, like I think he went in the trailer with, you know, was talking smack with some other celebrity or whatever, you know, and then and 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 the, and the Democrats thought, well, now now everybody, no woman's ever going to vote for him now, you know, yeah. not that guy. Meanwhile, they're all going. This guy's like David Lee Roth. He is a rock star. He does whatever he wants. And you know what? When he walked out of that trailer, what did he do? Did he grab her by the pussy? He went, he was very demure. He was very yeah. respectful. So yeah. yes, a lot of people get in the locker room and talk smack and, and, and the little triggered Democrats just can't handle that. You know, I think they played it the wrong way. They, they turned him into, they thought they were demoralizing him or showing him, showing who he really is. And and then they just turned him into a rock star, you know, yeah. but yep. yeah, he definitely lives by different rules. And I think maybe people like the idea of that, I mean, even with my own career, I, I remember like once I was in the Morton Downing show and um, it was a bunch of artists or I think four different artists. And, you know, the first artist comes out and they, they threw stuff at him and booed him and heckled him. And, and then the next artist came out, same thing. And then here I come and I'm thinking, Oh my God, it's like my artist committing felonies around the country, like repainting billboards. <laughs> They're really going to hate me. And, you know, and then this guy just, he does, he lives by his own rules. He just does whatever he wants. He breaks the law every day of his life. Just goes, does these crazy billboards. It's like, you know, and, I'm, and you can tell I'm like shaking. I'm like, oh, here it comes, you know. Hmm. And then one of them still says, you, we like. <laughs> <laughs> Do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> That's who we want to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think he tapped into that. It's like, you hmm. know, it's almost like society needs one person that just doesn't, doesn't have to live by the rules. That's our special guy. You know, he gets to do what the fuck he wants because he does. Mm -hmm. I mean, why is that so appealing, though? It's, I mean, it's there's something wrong with the psyche of the society if that is what's appealing. No, I think probably everybody's exhausted with them and sick of them and, and they've kind of figured out how corrupt and evil he is. But the problem is you'll never meet an ex grumpy because it's like they've defended him too hard and too long that they can't ever stop now. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, we invaded uh, Vietnam. It's like, that was stupid. But, you know, it's like now we have to win. You know, we can't yeah. back out and be cowards. I don't want to live the rest of my life having a bunch of libtards pointing at me going, hey, you can't fuck up on that one, didn't you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they don't want to do that. You know, it's like yeah. now they have to double down and get him in a second term and ride this thing out, you know? Yeah. So they can't say the the, the two words that, that nobody can say. I'm wrong. Oof. You know what I, mean? I mean, I can't even say it. Even if I talk about stuff that where I was wrong, then I also, you know, start trying to quantify why I did what I did. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I know that was wrong. And, but it, I just want you to understand, I wasn't trying to be evil. I wasn't trying to, you know, hurt anybody. This is what I was thinking at the time. Yes. But, but what I did was wrong. But, you know, e even, even if I can admit I was wrong, I still want to quantify like why I did what I did, that I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to be evil. I just didn't completely understand the situation. You know what I mean? Huh. So I'm yeah, wrong. That same, is, that is, I'm wrong is the, the three hardest words in the English language, you know. It's powerful. So you you know, you've always been very honest in your commentary and you have never really shied away from the controversial topics. Last time we spoke, you were planning on building this anti kind of anti border wall at the US, Mexico and US Canadian border. Mm -hmm. First of all, how is that project going? And second of all, what role do you feel that the artist has in documenting and challenging these mm. social issues? Well, we built a big section of the wall um, in, uh, at the Butterfly Ranch. And, um, and then we went over to Brownsville and we actually got proper permits there and built a section of the wall there, which is still standing. And then, then, then the quarantine happened. So um, there hasn't been any new additions to the wall since then. So it's so as soon as we can travel again, we can build more wall, but in the meantime, we're stuck. But just to kind of explain a little bit about the concept you're bringing in street artists, kind of artists with, um, you know, well-known names to actually come and paint sections of the wall. Right. Well, the, the, we started off at the, the Butterfly Center because, um, you know, they got like 50 acres that are being chopped in half by the wall. And it also gave us an opportunity to go down there and, you know, they gave us the land to build the wall along the border. And uh, so the, the idea is, is our wall is, is more like a concept and it's a place for people to express ideas. So like part of the part I built was all doors and 
and there was a part where you come through and you can check your color to see if you're the right color to come to this country or whatever. A lot of social, I used it as social commentary. Um, there was a whole section of uh, Mexican brands. So it was kind of like, oh, look, Mexico Mexico uh, paid me to have ads on my wall. So that's how I paid for the wall. Or just saying, yeah, there's a way to pay for the wall, you know, put ads on it. But uh, but it was it was a conceptual thing. And it was, you know, and other artists were coming in and, and doing stuff. And um, I think the, the virus kind of shut that down because we can't physically be there anymore. Mm. But anyway, it was it was just the, the uh, to try to demoralize the idea of the wall, you know. Like when I went to Palestine and painted the wall, you know, they they said, you know, you understand this is your wall, hmm. and, and like what are you talking about? It's like, you know, you paid for this wall. This is your wall, hmm. you know. So <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to come have an opinion about it. <laughs> what was that experience like being in Palestine? Um. Very depressing. They're 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 trapped. Um, they're in a big open air prison. You know, for two months a year, you know, arbitrarily they get their water cut off. Um, so they try to store water so they can prepare for. You know, like you think be, being in quarantine is hard. I mean, water still comes out of your faucet, man. You know, mm -hmm. um, I could paint the wall. I mean, there were guys with machine guns and turrets. You know, ain't with guns aimed at us. But I was, you know, pretty sure that if 80% of your like military budget comes from the United States of America, probably gunning down an American, you know, mm -hmm. probably wouldn't be the best political move because a lot of people do not understand what's going on there. Mm -hmm. When I was painting the wall, you know, CBS, NBC, they were all there. They were all there. And then, you know, one of them just looked at me and says, I don't know why they sent us here. We're not allowed to report on this. We're not allowed mm -hmm. to talk about this. And I said, maybe it's in case they run me over with a tank. <laughs> I says, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's very interesting, you know, and it was interesting. The little kids were interesting because, um, you know, they weren't allowed to go near the wall either. But, you know, they, they're all running around. Every building is like has has no roof on it. I mean, they, you can just see where they just shelled like the whole neighborhood. There's nothing. Every every building just doesn't even have a top floor. You know, there's a factory there with a hole you could, you know. Well, I mean, they shot a rocket through it. You know, I'm like, why is there a gigantic hole in your factory? And they're like, where do you think you are? <laughs> you know, but these poor little kids, like first they were like throwing rocks at us, you know. I mean, not just little pebbles. They were throwing rocks at us. Wow. And I told my assistant, it's like, yeah, go, go get them to quit throwing rocks at us, you know, because like, I'm mm. not going to get this done. And so he went over, he was an L.A. kid. So he went over and showed him a bunch of L.A. gang signs. And then they kind of bonded with him. And, and then by the next day, they were all helping me to the wall. And by the, the last day there, CNN was um, the leader of the, the little kids, um, Muhammad, was uh, doing an interview for CNN. And he was like, you know, I want to be an artist. Hmm. You know, so that was real cute. Of course, they didn't air the interview, but I didn't bother to tell them that they didn't air it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But at least it's documented somewhere, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. And yeah, and then at the border, they, you know, they held machine guns to my head and made me praise Israel before they would let me go back to the United States. And I don't know, it, it's not a good scene. Mm. I feel so sorry for those people. And there's nothing they can do, you know? I mean, Arafat stole all their money. Oh, oh one interesting thing though. Did you know that uh, George Bush is, you know, the guy that invaded the wrong country and torpedoed our economy, did, did repatriate a lot of the Palestinians' money. You know, he went to Paris and confiscated a lot of that money and took it back to Palestine. So, you know, that, that's mm. weird, you know? Mm. I never thought about him doing that. Mm -mm. So it must be, I mean, there's a whole host of emotions I could think about from what you just said, but, you know, it must certainly feel impactful to know that you have influenced the mind of a small child in an area that is just predominantly absorbed in conflict that, you know, for just a few seconds, that kid thought, I want to be an artist. Like there's an element of hope there. And I think that art can bring hope. It can bring challenge to social norms, but I mean, what do you take from those experiences? Um, you know, sometimes I feel like that we just go into places and we do our thing and then we leave, you know, and everybody else is just, they don't get to leave, you know? So mm. yeah, it's more depressing, I think. But, you know, I I, I don't know. Like like my, my Midwestern friends, I would thought, man, they would never put up anything like this. They would never be occupied, you know? But mm. yeah, they probably would. I, I think I misunderstood who, who they were, you know? I thought they would never tolerate this, but they would, you know, and they do, you know, so I don't know. I don't know. I wish I had some answers. <laughs> mm. So I, I read um, another quote by you that said, we, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say who the quote is by initially, but we're in sync. Sorry, this was not by you. This was by somebody who has your work. 
We're in sync in such a way that I can think of something and just know that he can make something that fits my vision. You know who that quote was by? No. <laughs> so it was Slash from Guns N' Roses. So oh, they did this album cover, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've made some really interesting friendships over the years. Tell us about working with Slash and perhaps some of your other kind of impactful or amusing friendships that have come from your work. I like I one thing I like about you know being an artist is uh, that that if I if I really do admire somebody or, or like their art that usually if I if I if I get a hold of them they'll they'll be happy to talk to me do you know what I mean and mm. and I I I love you know I thought he was his greatest guitar player and you know I really appreciated his art and uh, and I, I do understand his aesthetic and the, but but first I kind of researched it so like when he described like what kind of vibe he wanted you know, I, I knew what, I knew what to do, you know, I mean, I got him hmm. and I've done a couple for him. What does that creative process look like when you're working with somebody, you know, often I've heard, you know, from artists that commissions are really a challenge and, and often folks don't even engage in doing commissions because you are under that kind of pressure cooker of uh, that other person's expectations versus your kind of creative freedom. Yeah. But you know, I don't think anybody, creates in a vacuum, even though everybody has a muse or everybody has an audience or a perceived audience and the audience may not exist, but you know, you may be sitting in your studio and you, you, you're you making that art for somebody, hmm. you know what I mean? And, and that person may not exist, you know, or they may be, maybe they do exist, you know, but you know, maybe you just think this is I'm, my art's for super smart people who are clever and fun. And um, I, I don't, but you have an idea of, of who you're making it for. And then specifically if you're making it for somebody, I think it's very interesting. And for me, like a lot of my really big hit ideas were actually uh, rejected commissions because I kind of I'm, I'm thinking along a certain pattern and, um, you know, I, I'm broken out of that didactic by being challenged by somebody to do something and, and express something, you know, yeah. but the, the lady lips was made for the Rolling Stones um, that deal fell through before they even saw that. But, you know, that that became a very big image for me. Um, you know, Abraham Obama was, they, they called me up on Tuesday, the campaign and said, can you have us an image by Friday? And they were going to release it like as a print. And then, then, then it became something bigger, yeah. but so I needed to come up with something by Friday and, you know, I couldn't mess around. I, I, it, I think it's very healthy to get outside your bubble sometimes and try to help other people with their causes or, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, I, for me, it's been a really good thing doing commissions, but, uh. I know it's might be frustrating for other people. Have you ever said no to a commission or ever refused to sell a piece to somebody based on their ideologies, their beliefs, not well, liking them yeah. as a person? <laughs> no, no. Um, well, no, I, I never refuse to sell something to people because I don't sell my own art. Mm. So I, you know, a gallery picks it up. They, they have a, a contract to have it for 90 days or however long that the contract's for. So uh, generally, I don't know. The only time that really got stressed is uh, uh, at one point, I think uh, it, it appeared as if Michael Jackson had bought the painting of one of my little kids. And, oh. and I was pretty stressed about that. But but it turned out it was somebody else. But it was somebody else that you couldn't know who it was or do you know what I mean? Because he kind yeah. of bought stuff anonymously a lot. So I, so I was thinking that that weirds me out. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, mostly um, the people that buy my art are people that I would admire anyway you know actually have a lot of celebrities but also even have a lot of scientists you know hmm. um you know i think that i'm very proud of the people that have bought it and, and I'm, I'm i'm glad that i was able to you know have access to those people you know you you're, you're the guy that heads up the bank in canada is gonna you know have a nice dinner with you and he's gonna talk finance with you and you know who, who gets to do that you know and then the next night you're with bill gates and then you're with bono or do you know what i mean it's you get to have these deep, interesting conversations with a lot of people and your your passport into their lives is your art, you know? Hmm. It's incredible. I mean, it's kind of the artist's dream, I think, to be able to to get to that point. What would you say has been the, um, I hate to say the secret to your success, but what is what do you think gave you the edge over others? Um, I was, you know, not born with any money or any access to any money, so that wasn't it. Um, I think it's just persistence, you know, mm. 
I mean, it's, it, when everybody goes home and you're still there, then then you're the guy that's going to get used. <laughs> like, oh, you're still here. Well, here you do it. <laughs> you uh -huh. know what I mean? No, I mean, when I was very young, I was um, in the East Village and I had a, a phone and I would be in my studio painting if I was home. And, and I never didn't answer the phone. Um, and, you know, I said, like, I wasn't your first choice, was I? You know, and they're like, <laughs> you were 15. And I said, no, the other people answered the phone, did they? And like, nope. So they just, they need something. They go down the list. Um, the first person that picks up their phone gets a gig. <laughs> so, and sometimes I think you have to have some chutzpah, you know, like when mm -hmm. I got absolute English, I wasn't really a big enough artist at that point to, to be, to have that kind of ad. But, you know, I, I wrote some fake articles for uh, Detour Magazine or, you know, under a pseudonym, they weren't fake articles. Um, so that way I established myself as a journalist. And then, um, then I said, I, you know, I want to interview Michelle Rue, um, the, the CEO of the company. And, uh, he, you know, they, they vetted me, they called up the magazine and said, Oh, he's a really good writer, you know? And, um, and then I showed up and I said, well, you know, I, I don't really want to interview. I want you to, I want to be, I want to show you my art. And I'd made a painting of, you know, absolute bottle or whatever. And, and, uh, and yeah, he goes, you know, okay, I'm mad that you tricked me, but you know, what? I tricked a lot of people to make this vodka happen, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, so we're going to give you absolute English. And then he sat there and says, what else you got? And I showed him a bunch of transparencies and he bought seven paintings. <laughs> so, wow. But I, mean, you know, but I had to kind of trick him to get in the door. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because I don't think the whole art world was there in my lifetime was ever set up to receive uh, new talent. Um, mm -hmm. They told you to put together slides, drop off the slides. But, you know, I've never met a gallery that looks at slides. You know, there's one famous story of James Brown, the artist James Brown, dropped his slides off a of Tony Shafrazi gallery. And the guy looked at, you know, Tony looked at the slides and gave him a show. But, I mean, the reason that's this epic story is because that may be the only time that that ever happened, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. So mostly you get in through, you know, then you got into social connections. And, you know, so a lot of it was just trying to go to as much stuff as you can, meet as many people as you can. And, you know, so I don't know. I mean, sounds, if sounds you want like a heck of a lot of grit as well yeah. but you know if you want to get hit by a car you should probably stand in the road because it's probably you know one could drive through the side of your house but that's kind of not that likely mm -hmm. you know? and and also i was trying to explain it to my dad it's like yeah they're, they're very snobby but think about it this way if somebody knocked on your front door and said hey could i you know spend the night in your house mr english he'd call the cops or point a gun at him. You know what I mean? Right. But if they knocked on the door and said, Hey, I live in New York with Ron, you know, I, I'm a good friend of his there. And he said, Hey, if you're down in Texas, you know, look up my dad and he'll put you up for the night. And mm -hmm. Then my dad would like, you know, yeah, you can sleep here. Of course. As a matter of fact, you're going to sleep in my bed and I'm going to sleep on the couch and <laughs> let me make you dinner. And do you, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. So when, once I realized that it was kind of a social club, I think that was a very helpful insight. Yeah. But I don't know what it is anymore. I don't know like what it is for young artists. They always ask me for advice, and I just I feel like I, I don't know what to tell you, dude. I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know what artists do it now. I mean, I know that they have more access to the public, but then if everybody has it, does that help you? You know, right? And I I know none of them seem that interested in being in galleries anymore. And I'm still you know I still play the game that way. So I just find it easier to have somebody send a truck by and pick up all the paintings and then go deal with that. And they're like, they, they take half. And that freaks young artists out. They take half. Yeah, but it's like they're in New York City. They're on a storefront. Um, they're taking people out to lunch. All, you know, I've seen my dealer taking three different people out to lunch. I mean, he really had, he was running three dinners at three different restaurants. So we went from one to the other, you know. And then the one guy was like, I don't know. It's just like, it's, that's so much work. Mm -hmm. So you can just, you know, go down your bathroom and work on a painting. Right. Just to try to, you know, court people, you know. I don't know. So I, I've never had a problem with that. I've always enjoyed that. But uh, but I know the young artists just they think, why don't you just do it all yourself? It's work. It's work, you know. Um, but you know, I think it's also interesting because you can build up your whole career, you know. And you think I really did it all, you know. Mm -hmm. I got all the deals. I read all the contracts. I, you know, I made the paintings. I sold the paintings. I wrapped the paintings. So, you know, I do tell the young artists if if. If you sell a painting to somebody that's you know local, that you should definitely hand deliver the painting because then you're going to be in their house. You're going to see, oh, you got another wall there. It's like you know what? Maybe we should do something for there. You you know you're getting access to the actual customer. Mm -hmm. So using galleries is, is kind of weird sometimes because your access to them is very limited and very formal. Like if they decide they want to meet you, they'll ask for a dinner party or something. You know, <laughs> but you're not going to go to their house or do, do you know what I mean? You're, it, it's 
you lose some control by letting somebody else be the dealer. Mm. So I don't know. The people feel, who ask me for advice a lot. So I always feel bad. I feel like uh, you know, if the gallery is doing a lot of the groundwork for you and they're bring they're able to bring the right clients in front of your work and they're spending money on advertising then yes it makes sense right but there are a lot of galleries out there that don't invest in their artists like that yet still have that expectation of 50 or 40 percent mm -hmm. and i think that no, it, 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 it makes sense because you know in in the olden days you know even before i got in the art world you know if you got picked up by a gallery they just started they they, they rent you a studio sometimes they even get you a couple assistants um they would give you a stipend every month so that it would even out your money and and and, and they knew all the people that were going to buy the art and you know maybe yeah. they would spend the week in new york and then they would go to the hamptons and hang out with the collectors for the weekend and you know they earned their money you know mm -hmm. and they took out full page ads in the art magazines mm -hmm. and they had connections you know they were on the board of the moma or whatever Yep. But yes, slowly as more and more people, you know, open galleries, everybody wanted that 50-50 deal. And as a matter of fact, back in the day, you only, they only took 30% and did all that stuff for you. So, you know, but it, it seems like it all got whittled away. And then suddenly you're some gallery in Indiana with a $500 storefront, you know, and you want the artist to pay for the delivery of the work and then pay to have it shipped back if you don't sell it. And, <laughs> and they want half the money. My, my, my greatest moment, you know, is I was talking to a dealer and he goes, I need 15 paintings and 15 checks. <laughs> I'm like, what do I need you for? No, I mean, literally, he goes, I want 15 of your best collectors to write a check for 15 different paintings and I want you to deliver the 15 paintings, you know, spend two years making them or however long it takes and, uh, and I'll take half the money. How, what do you yeah. think? And you take know? your co your collectors that you already have relationships right. with. Right, yeah, yeah. So he's yeah. also taking your, your collectors yeah, that you have the relationships with. So Well, um, that's just obnoxious. Yeah, yeah that, that's 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 the peak. That's, it, yeah. it can't keep going on like that. You know? mm -mm. All right, folks. So we're going to take some questions for Ron in about five minutes. So if anybody has any uh, questions that they would like to uh, put forth, please just add them in the comments. You can do that on YouTube or you can do that on Facebook. So just want to revisit a little bit about the the idea of uh, cons consumerism and capitalism your mc or mcdonald's supersized uh character was is this obese looking version of ronald mcdonald mm -hmm. um, and it caught the eye of the director of the uh award-winning documentary supersize me mm -hmm. what a lot of your work kind of questions capitalism and you know makes you makes you kind of question the the idea of the consumer first of all what has the pushback been like from some of these brands have you ever been you know had to lit litigate and deal with a pushback from them and second of all what is what's your goal with the these these characters what do you hope people walk away with well originally um you know my first day of college i was going to be in advertising i went to the first you know the first seminar the first day um and then i just got up and walked out and went you know to the fine art department and uh but then i always thought about advertising and then it occurred to me that yeah they, they spend billions of dollars on advertising and they only tell one side of the story and there is no vehicle to tell the other side of the story you know so like if, if there's a huge problem with obesity and diabetes in america and people are spending billions of dollars to sell you the things that you know make these things happen you know, there, there's not there's not a lot of energy on the other side because there's no money on the other side. So I thought maybe the the, the way to to combat that or, or tell the other side of the story is just to sort of do it illegally and just take over billboards and do it you know that way. But I felt like the other side you know, needed to be told. But you know, I once um, you know had a meeting with the congressman and 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 he, he you know he just said, look, you know, it's like your your side of the story. You know, like if you if you're worried about the environment, you know, the environment doesn't give me any money, but the corporations do. And it's like, I'm just going to tell you, it's like, next time you come here, you bring a shoebox full of money. And, you know, he would, then he laughed. So it was like a joke, but I mean, it, it kind of wasn't, it was kind of like, there's nobody, to def there's no money in defending the environment. There's only money into, you know, uh, skir skirting regulations and dumping toxins in. So I don't have to pay, you know, for scrubbers on my smokestacks or whatever, but you know, the money's on this side and it's not on the other side. And there's, there's no voice on the other side because there's nobody to pay for it, you know? And I just thought in my little way that that maybe I could just tell a little bit of the other side of the story. Hmm. What is I thought that you know I could never afford a billboard, but I could steal. I, I ended up stealing over a thousand. You know, um, wow. even if I even if I spent a year in jail or whatever, I mean, it's 
the, the cost analysis, I couldn't earn enough money in a year to back then to, mm-hmm. to pay for a billboard. So it still kind of worked out financially, <laughs> you know? So you would just go on up the middle of the night, kind of work um, over these existing billboards? I started off doing stuff in the middle of the night. And then it kind of occurred to me that um, anybody that's out doing the stuff at night is very, it's very suspicious because nobody's yeah. going to paint a billboard in the middle of the night. Um, but if you put on like a, you know, orange vest or a shirt that says billboard painters get high every day, or if you dress like, you know, if you wear like coveralls and, and you put a couple cones out front and, you know, you have your van with, you know, we have those metallic signs that we put on that say, you know, the name of our billboard company. And we'd have some fake paperwork in the, on the dashboard. And, and it's just, but nobody would ever bother you. I mean, the cops would just sometimes stop and watch us do the billboard. And then when it was up, they would leave because it never occurred to them in the middle of the day, we're just going to be, you know, just doing this, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, the, the night thing never is not the best way to do this kind of stuff. It's best to do it right in front of everybody. In plain sight. Because it, people see what they expect to see. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Well, you remember, um, what was it? Uh, what was the guy's name? Uh, Revs? You know, he, he bombed the subways for years with those weird poems, and they never could catch him. And I think it took 20 years to finally catch him. And they figured out he just had an MTA outfit. <laughs> he yeah, did. He had a him. And, and he's, he, he said he'd pass a lot of the same people every day. You know, got his lunchbox in his hand. It was full of spray paint. But, yeah. you know, hey, morning, morning. And they just say, yeah, he works here. <laughs> you know? Wow. It's like, you know, he doesn't actually work here. You know? But it doesn't make any sense to people because why Why would you go to a nasty place like that every day like it's your job? Nobody's paying you. They're paying us, you know? So it just, it, the other, the, his side of the equation didn't make any sense. So they, it, yeah. so he became, people just saw he was an employee. But that's how he got away with it for so long. It's people brilliant. see what they like to see, yeah. Did you ever... Uh work anonymously did you you know did you always have your your uh profile out there you know claiming who you were did you sign your work as ron english no no when i started in the 80s um, my name was randall hart um, which what i called my art form was vandal art so it just kind of sounded like vandal art um and so i would sign it that way and um it, it was weird once um i lived in austin and i just did a bunch of billboards in dallas and the, the dallas morning news called me up and said we need to speak with uh randall hart and I don't know why it weirded me out because I thought maybe it's really not the Dallas Morning News or I, I don't know what I, I just thought it's weird. How do you know that's mm-hmm. me, you know? And, and, uh, and I said, well, you know, Randall, Randall, Randall died last week. <laughs> and the, the journalist is like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, co- we didn't even expect it. Heart attack. Fucking never expected it. Yeah. Yeah. We were roommates. And, uh, but then after that, I just said, fuck it. I'm me, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they can figure out who you are anyway. Might as well just be you. But, you know, sometimes like the, the billboard company would call me up and say, I'm a journalist. And it's like, well, no, you're not. Mm. No, you're not. Because a journalist, will, you know, they'll brag about who they write for. I, I'm, I'm a journalist for the New York Times. Right. <laughs> you know, you know you're not just, nobody's just a journalist, you know. No, I've had like, that was always interesting because I was always talking to them too, you know, periodically. And uh, and it was kind of like a standoff. They're, I'm like, why don't you arrest me? And they're like, because we don't know how that'll turn out, you know. And and you 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 know that that sixty percent of our billboards are already illegal. You, you have knowledge that the public doesn't need to know because you know we keep building them and then and we don't get permits for them and nobody says anything. So we just you know we're rolling you know and uh, and we're supposed to give fifteen percent you know as PSAs and we don't do that you know and nobody seems to remember that we're supposed to do that. And you know it just seems like it would be a can of worms. And and at the end of the day, how many how many a how many billboards can you actually do? You know compared to us and. and you know, at one point they even said, look, if you just fucking quit, you know, doing our billboards, we'll give you free billboards. Mm-hmm. And I said, you'll tell me where to put them and what to put on them. It's like, That's amazing. Yeah, of course. And it's like, well, no, no, I think it became a problem because sometimes they would bring clients to see a spectacular billboard that it paid for it. And it would be my stuff. And that would oh. be, that was, but again, you know, it, it was weird because they didn't, they didn't want to confront me because they didn't know how it turned out. They were afraid that somehow I'd become some kind of folk hero and they would be villainized, you know? Mm. So, like, you, you you don't want to get you don't want to ask a question that you don't know the answer to, or do you know what I mean? Or you don't want to get in some lawsuit or something where you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Huh. But I think that, that it probably the dynamic has changed. I think Clear Channels bought up all the billboards, so you know 
they're going to con completely control the control the message now. So that probably I would it wouldn't be as easy for me to do it now as it was before. I don't think. Did you ever hear from the likes of McDonald's or Disney or you know some of these other companies that you really kind of hammered into? Um, it's uh, not McDonald's, but uh, um, Disney. Yeah, we had a lawsuit. Um, but you know, again, they they I got the volunteer lawyers for the arts. I had eight lawyers, and they were the top lawyers in New York, and they didn't have a case. You know, because what I'm doing isn't illegal. Not as far as the um, you know the my stuff is parody. So mm -hmm. like what they would go after me for, it's, they would just go after me to harass me or try to wear down my bank account. And so if I have volunteer lawyers, it's like, you know, I can fight you for 10 years. <laughs> you know, it, no, but it, it, it happened to another guy, uh, Tom Forsythe, same thing. Um, he got sued by Mattel. Um, he did uh, Barbie, Barbie in a Blender. He was doing stuff with Barbies. Matter of fact, the only people that were buying his art was uh, agents of Mattel. And they they sued him. And, um, and again, he went to the volunteer lawyers for the arts. And um, he his he won, and and Mattel was required to pay his lawyers a million and a quarter, you know, for their efforts. Nice. So the three lawyers for the arts got a million bucks. Wow! Nothing because if he would have paid, you know, if he had seventy grand to play with or whatever, you know, and he would have ran his own, you know, hired his own lawyers, then he would have got paid out a million dollars in harassment, you know, for you know for the countersuit, but. Uh, but he didn't. So the the so there's also a downside to using the lawyers, you yeah. know, the lawyers, because if you do win, and then you can win a judgment against the other side for you know harassment or whatever, that you they get to keep the money. So. Right. But you know the thing is, I, a lot, I with all the my art practice, there, I'm not, I'm not breaking any copyright laws. Right. You know, it just seems like I am. So, so they, they really don't have any legs to stand on unless they just wanted to harass, you know. Hmm. I mean that that can all change. We're about to become very right wing, and they're going to be they're going to protect the corporations and their their property over the free speech. I believe, but I, I, it's hard to say. I don't know. And I think the the law in terms of art from the other angle as well has a long way to go because I'm seeing a lot of folks imagery, imagery original artwork being shared you know in places that they don't necessarily have the permission to do so so mm -hmm. we're, we're going to see a big shift I think it's still the wild wild west of the internet that we're contending with but um, I just want to give a little shout out for anyone who has not got Ron's book original grin go check it out it is awesome um, obviously, if you want to purchase some of Ron's art, hit up Ron's website. Uh, we're going to make sure there's a link for that in the comments as well. Um, but let's look at some of these questions. And first of all, I, apparently I'm in like a sunroom today. I moved my studio today and I've been followed around by the sun. So if you're wondering what, what all this strange light is about, I apologize. All right. So we have a question from Jan. Jan says, in Sells, Arizona, is the San Miguel Gate known as the gate? It has never been a legal border crossing. Nomad nomadic Native Americans have used this gate to traverse their land on both sides of the border instead of a wall. Oh, instead of a wall, would you consider creating an artist bridge? And what could that look like? Hmm. Hmm. Well, um, I don't know, but you know, the, my wall does have a, a places with ladders and and rock climbing. You know things you can there it's quite easy to to reverse and also um with my wall we we keep the um keep it one foot off the ground so it doesn't impede animals or anything so um i think my wall would probably work quite well there but uh yeah bridge would be pretty epic that's awesome but you said you have a a, a color a skin color test to see if folks can get that was just one of the weird things it's uncle sam and it's like one of those rides where you you have to be this high to, to to enter this ride or whatever mm -hmm. so you have to be this colored in and it's funny because everybody was going through the door and checking their color and i also installed one at the border as you came in from mexico wow. it was it was again like nobody's paying that close of attention so you're just installing something and you know and there's the guards right there you know there's the border patrol just like ignoring you because they think you're a workman but anyway it was weird because everybody was checking their skin color as they came in it's yeah anyway <laughs> But yeah, bridge sounds great. Let's do it.
Uh, I can't hear you anymore. Sorry. I guess you can't hear me either. No. How's that? Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I can. I don't know what the heck happened there. Yeah, Jen was asking, is there an image anywhere of the wall? Uh, we would love to see it. Oh, uh, um, it's on my website, propaganda.com. Uh, I'm not saying propaganda. I'm saying pop, P-O-P, oh. propaganda, yeah. I'm putting that in the comments right now. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, Ron, thank you. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you and get inside that brilliant mind. And thank you for, you know, taking the time out to, to chat with us and coffee with artists. It was such a pleasure. And uh, we look forward to keeping up with, uh, with your, with your journey. Yeah. We'll have fun with the puppy. I'm jealous. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And be well. Love to the, uh, to the English family. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Be well. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back again tomorrow for Coffee with Artists. Thank you guys. <laughs>